For interviews on educational technology and for a list of our educational technology workshops, please visit www.edtechlive.com. To join in the discussion on School 2.0, please visit www.school20.net. And for discounted Dell computers, please visit our sponsor, www.k12computers.com. So I think this is a fantastic time to be a teacher. The other thing I've advised schools to do, and, and this quite often works, is instead of um, jumping up and down and ranting and raving, is to say to the administrators, will you allow me to um, set up one group which I would closely supervise and monitor and note down what they're doing. In other words, a kind of pilot study. Um, and we'll see how it goes. And in a sense, if you put that forward in the right way and you set it up properly, there's not really that much of an argument against it. And I found that that can be quite successful as a way forward. Because quite often I think administrators are just scared of stuff they don't know about or they don't understand about. And they just need to be educated a little bit. I actually think what the technology does is enable good teachers to put into practice things they may have always wanted to do. Hi, this is Steve Hargadon and it is Tuesday, January 23rd. And my guests today are Terry and Elaine Friedman. Welcome to both of you. Hi. Hi. Terry, would you start today by uh, giving us a little bit of your background, and, and uh, we'll ask Elaine the same. Uh, and tell us um, you know, specifically uh, what you do and what's brought you to this point. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, well, at the moment, I'm um, an ICT consultant, independent consultant. And um, what that really means is that I work with schools and local authorities, which are the English equivalent to school districts, I suppose, um, to help schools get the best out of their their ICT, their educational technology, um, and that involves um, that involves a range of things, such as um, helping helping them to write bids, for example, for new equipment or new initiatives, that kind of thing or um, helping them to manage their resources. So, so for example, I'm doing quite a lot of work in, in one, one area, helping schools to manage the technical support for their computer equipment. And I also, we also run our own website, uh, ictandeducation.org. And, um, and, and, and that's really for, well, we post articles every day uh, about educational technology and the management of it uh, and we both come from a teaching background and the other thing I want to mention well two other things uh, three other things actually um, is that I belong to various organizations so if, for example I'm chair of a group called NACE which is I suppose um, the English equivalent of ISTE in a way um, it's uh, an advisory body and when I say advisory, what I mean is we help to advise the government in the UK. We work very closely with those sort of people. Um, and again, to improve educational technology in this country. And we're what you might call a, a subject associate, uh, association for people involved in educational technology. Um, I also belong to a group called MirandaNet. In fact, I'm what is called a MirandaNet Fellow, and MirandaNet is an organisation which is very much classroom research based. So that's quite an exciting place to um, to, to be. And the other thing I belong to is the British Computer Society, the BCS, and I, I'm a member of a group there called the Education and Training Expert Panel, which is invitation only. Now, the interesting thing about all of this is that. If you imagine a Venn diagram, all the circles coincide, so uh, or, or overlap, I should say. So, for example, Miles Berry, um, just to give you an example, he and I did um, a talk last week, and um, that was on the subject of Web 2 and social technologies in education. And he and I are both members of the British Computer Society expert panel, the one I just mentioned, 
but we're also both members of uh, NACE, so we could have met up there. And there's someone else who um, is a contributor to the to the book, Coming of Age, someone called Michelle de, de Crane, and um, she's a member of um, MirandaNet, which is actually where I first met her, yet she's actually living in America. So that's one of the things I find really, really interesting and fascinating about this stuff, is that you meet similar people or sometimes the same people wearing different hats. So shall I stop there? Well, that's a, a good place to pause so I can ask a question. Tell hmm. me about your teaching background. Oh, right, okay. Um, well, I started teaching in 1975, and um, I was using computers right from the word go, although obviously not, not in the same way as today. My, uh, I, I started off teaching business studies and economics, and the first use of computers was um, running a, 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 simulation, a simulation of the stock exchange with my students. That was quite interesting because we, um, we'd, we'd work out what stocks and shares we wanted, and then we had to send them off by post, and then a week later we'd get the results. So, so next time people get a blue screen error, they should think about waiting a week to see the feedback. That was quite interesting. But then, um, as computers got better, we started to run a game called um, Running the British Economy, and that was really fascinating, because the aim of the game was to run on a computer, I should say. The aim of the game was to try and balance out the British economy such that there wasn't too much uh, unemployment, and not too much inflation. But what I found really great was to undermine it in a sense to try and find out what the underlying model was or the underlying assumptions I should say. And what I got the students to do was not to um, not to focus on steering the economy in a nice balanced way but to actually go for zero inflation or zero unemployment. And then we'd be able to work out from the effects of doing that what the underlying assumptions of the model were and then relate them back to economic theory. And I've sort of done that kind of thing ever since, which is, and I think it's what teenagers do as well, actually, what, lot, what lots of people do, that they take something and they use it for a purpose for which it was never originally intended. Anyway, I stopped teaching in 1998 when I became what is called an advisor for ICT, Information Communication Technology. And that's where you go around advising other schools what to do uh, in order to, to get the best out of it. Then I went to work for an organization called the QCA, which is um, a governmental body in this country. Um, and I was working on the online test, which you may have heard of. And then I went to work for a local authority at quite a high level, and then in 19, sorry, when did I leave? 2004, I decided it was time I, I worked for myself on the grounds that if I was going to, um, well, I won't say on what grounds at the moment in case I insult anyone, but uh, I just thought if I'm, basically, if I'm going to uh, work 15 hours a day, I'd rather be doing it for myself. And that, that was really the motivation for that. Well, it sure sounds like you had a lot of experience. Yes. And I belong to ISTE as well. I don't know if I mentioned that. But at one point, I was the admin. But, uh, I, was, I was quite active in the admin um, special interest group. So, yeah. Now, uh, Elaine, are you there? Yes, I am. Yes. Tell us I how am. you fit into this picture. Well, I do a lot of the backroom work. When you run a business in the UK, there's a lot of paperwork. So um, I try and handle all that. But I must admit that my failings lie in the accountancy side. So we pass all that up off to a professional accountant. So, but other than that, I shift all the paperwork. And we discuss teaching issues together because I've got 20 years in teaching from a completely different um, side of things. What um, kind of teaching did you do? Well, I started off with agriculture, <laughs> which is a bit odd because it doesn't exist anymore. I, I taught rural science and then science and maths, which is completely alien to Terry because he feels that he's not any good at those things. And um, No, I know I'm not any good at those things. No, well, he's wrong. Um, and then I specialised in uh, 
young people with emotional behavioural difficulties, you know, teenagers, and then went to work for a local authority. It's like a school district. Um, and then I left and we became a, a small business. And so we set up and uh, what we wanted to do was to provide information, as Terry said, on, for ICT co coordinators and managers so that they can they've got the help and support they need really it's all about how to lead and manage your department or your area could, could i just say there steve what in this country we have lots of visionaries um who have great ideas but when you say well what do i actually do or or <laughs> what, what 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 do i actually do on monday morning then um they don't always have an answer and that's what uh, what uh, our website was set up to address, really, and that small business. Yes, it's born of frustration um, that there are lots of people around who can provide advice. You know, you've, they, they've got all this these ideas, but nothing to say, well, you've got a group of six lads at the back of the room. How do you teach them when they won't, you know, they won't face you? Or that sort of thing, and you've got you've got um, man leading and management ideas, or um, you have a particular classroom, and uh, somebody you go to that class, and all the mouse balls are missing. So, how as a manager do you deal with that? And that is what this business is all about. How do you manage it? Does that help? It does. I think it helps Good. a lot. So it's eleven twenty-two in the morning in California. And I'm looking out the window at a crystal clear, what would be cold for us day, probably in the low 50s Fahrenheit. Oh, sure. So, so let's t let's talk about the miracles of technology. <laughs> uh, we're using Skype. Where are you located, and and what time of day is it for you? Um, we're located in England. It's um, nine. It's seven twenty-three in the evening. Um, and it's pitch black outside. And it's we're, probably freezing now. Um, yes, it's freezing outside as well. So we still have the heating on. So you'll forgive me if I don't show much sympathy that your temperature is only in the 50s. <laughs> <laughs> You've got a north wind I mean, I, I, was in California, I was in California in um, July. And, um, well, certainly my relative's idea of what is cold bears no relation to what I would regard as cold. Um, you know what they regarded as cold. I, I thought I was pleasantly warm, so uh, it's um, you know all, all, all what you're used to, I suppose. But this is pretty amazing because at the same time as we've been talking, I had someone called Sharon Peters trying to get me on Skype, and she's based in Montreal. So the whole thing is so fascinating; it's incredible. I absolutely agree with you, and and it occurred to me the other day that. I probably speak to someone in another country once a day. <laughs> and and I think my kids, when they're older, are going to be surprised at how limited our contact was um, geographically. Mm. Yes. That, we've, that we felt very, that I have previously felt very limited in my ability to communicate with others. I, mm. I look at a World Time Clock website quite often now just to determine when I can communicate with somebody. And I mm. think that's pretty amazing. It is. Yes, I, I, I've got a time converter website bookmarked, which I wouldn't have had five years ago or ten years ago. So tell me a little bit about uh, how the first edition of Coming of Age came about. And and then we'll um, after we explore that, I'll give you a chance to talk about what's, what's coming up. Great, thank you. Um, well, the first edition of Coming of Age came about really for the sorts of reasons that Elaine and I have been talking about. Um, I, I felt that um, certainly in England there were lots of people trying to, um, or, 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 lot, there were lots of people who were potentially interested in blogging and wikis and th those sorts of things. But because of the kind of pressures that teachers are under here, and I, I imagine elsewhere as well, in terms of having to deliver good exam results, um, I felt that they didn't really have the time to trawl the internet looking for good practice or 
especially as if you don't know what you don't know, you don't know if that's going to be time well spent. So my idea was to get together about a dozen case studies of of people who have actually used blogs or wikis in the classroom. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and to say, okay, this is what I did. This is um, how I did it. This is why I found it useful. And if you feel like doing it, why don't you have a go? This is what you actually do. Um, and it really was. It really did start uh, as simply as that. Um, and then I just started uh, uh, approaching people I knew or people who knew people I knew and said, would you, would you like to contribute to this? It, it's completely free. You get nothing for it except um, some publicity for your website or, or whatever. And people stepped up to the plate, which I, I think is the term you use. And, and, and then it just went on from there. It, what, I have to say, it, it was pretty phenomenal the way it took off. Um, I worked out that altogether, uh, before I stopped bothering to try and keep up with counting it, I worked out that something like 60,000 people must have downloaded it or read it in some way. I either downloaded it or had people pass it on to them which I think is a pretty phenomenal thing, really. So that is phenomenal. W one of the dynamics that, that I think we're seeing here in the United States is that you have a group of early adopter teachers, practitioners, who are very excited about these tools and are, and are doing great things. But you have a pretty widespread lack of awareness outside of that early adopting group of what these tools mm. are. Mm. I spoke last week to a group of um, technology directors for school districts in an area of California, and most of them were really unaware of any of the elements of Web 2.0. Do you find that you are encountering the same dynamic there? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, and, and actually not only amongst teachers, amongst kids as well sometimes, funnily enough, because they perhaps haven't been exposed to it in school. Um, you know, they might know about MySpace and things like that, but they, they don't think about blogging in any kind of educational way. But yes, um, I come across it all the time. And in fact, last week when, when Miles and I were doing this talk together, that, that was really interesting because... Um, we did a kind of double act. He he was explaining the um, theoretical underpinnings of social technologies and, and, and talking about the pedagogy. And I was saying my role was to say, and here's an example of how it's how it's used, you know, um, but by showing video clips or, or whatever. And the audience were, at, were were completely enwrapped by all of this. But it was actually, or my section of it certainly, but was fairly low-level stuff in many respects, um, quite deliberately so, because I don't see the point in saying, you know, here's an example of what you can do when you've been doing this stuff for 10 years. There's no point in doing that. Um, and someone came up to me afterwards and said, now I understand what this is all about. And in fact, I, I spoke to someone today, someone phoned me, um, someone called um, Dr. John Cuthel, who's um, uh, he's in Mirandanet as well. And he apologized for having to leave the talk. He was at the talk um, without talking to me afterwards. But he said he really enjoyed it. And he said the reason he enjoyed it was because it actually focused on what, what you can do with the technology as opposed to the technology itself. And I think that's, that's the problem with a lot of um, bloggers and people like that on the Internet. So Sometimes I feel... They, they get carried away with the actual technology part of it as opposed to what you can do with it. And in England, we, we have this inspection regime, which has kind of uh, eased off a little bit now. But these inspectors would come into a school and they'd look at what you were doing in the classroom and, and evaluate it. And their underlying question uh, that guided all of their dealings with the school was, so what? So you could say, right, uh, to the inspector, I've got this fantastic classroom of the future. I've got an interactive whiteboard on every 
uh, on every wall. I've got this, I've got that. All the kids use their cell phones. Uh, and the inspector's answer would be, so what? In other words, how has that contributed to learning? And, and that was their, not their sole criteria, but certainly a very fundamental one. Um, and that has tended to be my criteria when evaluating all of this kind of thing. You know, it's always been, how can that actually help a teacher or a student? What can, what can you actually do with it? So that's a great question. Because one of the things that I hear is, we've had computers in the classroom for 20 years. Mm. What makes this technology any different? Yes. Exactly, because you can look at, you can go into a room where there's a teacher using an interactive whiteboard and take a photo, and then you could compare it to a photo of a teacher using a blackboard in the 1950s, and you wouldn't see any difference. Um, and that isn't necessarily to blame the teacher, because I think there's a whole lot of management issues behind that. So to give you an example, um, last year I came across um, a head teacher. I think you call them supervisors or principals of a school who had decreed that every teacher in the school has to use their interactive whiteboard all the time. He, he, he wanted, when he walked around the school, to see these interactive whiteboards active and in use. And my, my issue with that, two issues, were one, um, why? You know, sometimes it's easier to write things on the back of an envelope. Than, than, than to do it like that. You know, it should be appropriate technology used appropriately. But secondly, what about all of the stuff that underlies that? What, what about um, training for the teachers? What about um, technical support? I was in a school a few days ago um, with a technician and we were walking around the school and someone stopped him, uh, a teacher, and said, oh look, my interactive whiteboard has become un uncalibrated. Can you help me? now?" That is a really, really low-level type of um, issue, but it was a big issue for the teacher because she couldn't actually carry on with on with her lesson. So, what if you have a, a situation in which there are 50 teachers all experiencing that at the same time? Do, do, do you see what I mean? There are some things which aren't scalable and they aren't feasible unless you've made sure that there's lots of scaffolding um, underlying it. You can't just walk in and say, right, from next Monday we're all going to be using blogs and wikis or whatever it is. And, and that's the kind of thing I'm interested in. So that would seem to be quite a dilemma because the world of Web 2.0 or what we're calling Web 2.0, the read-write technologies, changes so quickly. I know. How do you address that? And also, are you experiencing the same kind of pushback and administrative level about the capability of students actually writing to the web. Can you explain what you mean by pushback, please? Sorry. Well, it, uh, I would use that phrase to mean that if I'm a teacher and I get very excited, say, about blogging, and, and I want to use blogging in the classroom, it can be very difficult to convince the administrators to actually open up access to sites on the web that allow mm users to put content up. Yes. Uh, yes, that is an issue. Um, and th the reason it's an issue is because the local authorities ultimately um, are legally um, are legally liable, or think they are, for anything bad that might happen. And so local authorities have to ensure that the schools in their within their remits, if you like, um, are, are completely protected by filtering systems and so on and so forth. So what um, I've suggested to schools is that what they do is they, well, they either make sure that um, uh, the ideal situation is where the, 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 where the teachers know what they're looking for and they teach the students how to be discerning on the internet in all sorts of ways, not just in terms of online safety, personal safety, but in terms of knowing whether a, what a website is telling you is, is actually worth reading or, or a blog or whatever. So there's all those kind of issues. But ultimately, if, if the administrators 
won't allow it, if they simply say stop, then, uh, or no rather, I think what you have to do is simulate it. You, what I think is the worst case scenario is where you say, well, we can't do it or it's too dangerous, so we're not going to do it because these kids are still going on MySpace and all the rest of it outside school. And I think schools have a duty of care to ensure that, um, that, that students know how to conduct themselves online. You know, uh, the other thing I've advised schools to do, and, and this quite often works, is instead of um, jumping up and down and ranting and raving, is to say to the administrators, will you allow me to um, set up one group, which I would closely supervise and monitor and note down what they're doing. In other words, a kind of pilot study. Um, and we'll see how it goes. And in a sense, if you put that forward in the right way and you set it up properly, there's not really that much of an argument against it. And I found that that can be quite successful as a way forward. Because quite often I think administrators are just scared of stuff they don't know about or they don't understand about. And they just need to be educated a little bit. So there are some teachers who are really excited about the potential for the Read Write Web as it relates to learning. Mm. Are you that excited? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I, um, I'm surprised you even have to ask. Um, yes, I mean, I'm tremendously excited. I think it's fantastic. And, and, and I get excited about very, very, um, I suppose you would say very small things in a way. Um, I, I, I was recently commissioned to um, write an article about um, uh, podcasts. So I decided to do it on um, musical podcasts, this particular one. And I was talking to um, Sharon Peter's 14-year-old daughter. Um, over Skype and um, I asked her if she ever, uh, ever I asked her how she found out about music on the internet and basically it's all to do with social networking she and I thought by that she meant her friends on MySpace but in fact that, 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 that actually plays a very minor part what happens is she finds bands that she likes just by exploring and um, on MySpace this is and then she'll leave a comment for them saying something like, I really like your music. And then apparently what happens is other bands who play similar music will come along and say, oh, look, Meg likes this music. She'll probably like ours. Let's leave her a message. And that's how it grows. Now, in a sense, that's um, technologically, that's very low level. But what I find exciting is what the technology is actually enabling Meg and people like her to do. And listening to her, I mean, I, I actually think I'm quite young, but in an old body. It actually did make me feel a bit like an old fossil because I thought, well, I hadn't thought of that, you know. Um, so I think we really do need kids to teach us, to be perfectly honest, to some extent. But, yeah, I, I definitely find all this stuff very, very exciting. And, in fact, I always was an early adopter because I remember back in 1990 working with a, um, a group of students um, I, I actually set up uh, what was, in effect, e uh, an email system. <clears throat> uh, this was back in 1990, as I say, in which the students, I had the students send me their work online, and I marked it and then sent it back to them online. Uh, and I was experimenting with that kind of stuff 16, 17 years ago. So I think this is a fantastic time to be a teacher. I mean, I would love to be a teacher now. I mean... You know, I'd love to be able to have an interactive whiteboard as as part of what I use. When they when they first came out, I was going to uh, I saw one and I thought I must have one of these. And I went to my head teacher on the Monday morning following this trade show. And um, I said, "Can I see you for a minute?" He said, "Yes." He said, "But before that, he said, why?" Well, why have you put in this bill for 50 pounds this is like in those days 75 dollars for an ink cartridge why why hasn't it lasted longer and when he said that i thought there's absolutely no if he's worried about 75 dollars there's no point in my saying can i have the equivalent of ten thousand dollars to buy an interactive whiteboard 
But now, I mean, they're so cheap and easy. It's almost the opposite. A head teacher would probably wonder why you hadn't asked for one. In our family, now, when we watch a movie, we immediately go to the Internet. Mm. And we'll look at Wikipedia, and we'll look at the Internet Movie Database, and we'll look at the historical context of a particular Victorian drama or whatever it is. And and I feel as though learning in our family has changed. Hmm. Now, are these technologies going to transform education? Is that too big a, a leap to believe that they can actually change the way that we learn? What I'm going to say is probably going to sound completely politically incorrect in uh, amongst the circles that will end up listening to this podcast. Um, I actually believe that what transforms education is not the technology, or transforms learning is not the technology, but it's the way the teachers use the technology. Um, and there's been research, I mean I, I can't quote from it now, it's a long time ago, but there's been research for example which, which, which has shown that a teacher a, a really creative teacher could take something uh, something as banal as um, an overhead projector and create lessons that absolutely fly and inspire the kids. So I actually think what the technology does is enable good teachers to put into practice things they may have always wanted to do. My uh, wife Elaine was telling me for example and again, this is a fairly fairly low level. She she had a geography teacher who used to draw these fantastic maps, absolutely wonderful, coloured, detailed maps of um, of various countries and continents on the blackboard. And then then at the end of the lesson, would have to rub it out, and then next week do it again. You imagine if that teacher had access to an interactive whiteboard. Um, so I just think I think that the technology mainly allows teachers to um, to do easier what they would have done anyway somehow what do you think of that answer well it's interesting because as I heard the answer I almost heard the opposite of what you said you were saying <laughs> yeah. meaning quite possibly <laughs> I did think the opposite at one point <laughs> well it seems as though the technology is enabling opportunities to put into practice teaching styles that have been hard to actually accomplish without the technology. Mm. So, so maybe there's a balance there. And probably what happens is you look at the technology and, and you think of something you could do that would never have occurred to you with the old technology. Elaine wants to say something about a microscope she discovered recently. Oh, well, I went to the pet show um, last a couple of weeks ago. That's the British Educational, what is it? Technology something show. Yeah, Technology something show. Anyway, it's for educationalists who uh, teach technology. Anyway, while we were there, um, I saw something which has been on the market for ages, but um, because I've been out of um, teaching science for so, so long, I didn't know it was around. It was a microscope which you can attach to an interactive whiteboard. Now, had I had that mm. when I was teaching biology, it would have been a fantastic thing because I could have been sure that the kids were seeing what I wanted them to see. And I could have annotated it on the interactive whiteboard and we could have spoken about it intelligently instead of me whizzing around all the, all the microscopes saying, now, look down the microscope, trying to get the thing in focus, hmm. saying to the kids, now, can you see what I see? Then we swap over and they've probably got different eyesight to mine and they're probably not seeing what I saw. And that is such a wonderful thing because it really enables the teacher to achieve exactly what they wish, wish to achieve. Well, that head cam we saw. Yes. Uh, we saw this brilliant head cam, which um, is a video camera that you um, put around your head, hence the name. And, and so you can take hands-free videos. So, for example, if you wanted to show someone how you, how you um, serve in tennis, for example, or something like that, or how you change gears in, um, in, in a car, you can just do it without without killing yourself in the process. I mean, it's fantastic. 
but I want to get hold of one so I can put it on our cat to see what he gets up to. But I'll probably be reported to somebody if I do that. <laughs> the cat, by the way, is helping us with the podcast. Yeah, he's sitting on my lap. <laughs> Keeps you calm. He he sometimes does, except um, when I'm trying to meet the deadline and he, he decides to walk across the keyboard, which is incredibly infuriating. <coughs> Never mind. Can you tell me some of the web tools that you particularly find most compelling in an educational environment? Mm, um, well, uh, blogs, wikis. I love using Flickr and related tools, you know, Flickr toys, that sort of thing. What else do we, uh, do we use trying to think? My brain's just turned off. Yeah. Um, I've tried using blogs and um, superglue with uh, a group of student teachers I'm teaching. That's been quite an interesting experiment. Um, I've enjoyed doing that. Podcasts. Oh, yeah, yeah. How can I forget that? Yes, I, I've, I've tried quite a bit of experimentation with podcasts, which I really, really love because I just find it so accessible. And something I did recently was um, uh, I, I put something out in, in a newsletter I run, which basically said, look, I, I love doing podcasts, but I don't have time for all the messing about and the editing afterwards. Is there a school that would like to work with, work with me on this? And um, a school did come forward, and I really, really enjoyed working with um, the teacher and the kids at the school to produce what ended up as being quite a nice podcast which if anyone is interested, it's podcast episode number 20, which is uh, accessible from my website. But the really interesting thing I thought for that, uh, in that was I was talking to the kids. Um, I went down to the school and, and, and I said, what do, what do you actually get out of, um, what did you actually get out of this exercise or what do you get out of doing podcasting apart from learning technical skills? And they were saying things like, um, you know how everyone, when they first hear a recording of their voice, they absolutely hate it. They can't believe it's them. Um, they said that podcasting helped them to get over that. And therefore, as a result, they feel a lot more confident about the prospect of going for job interviews and things like that. And I suppose when you think about it, that's quite an obvious thing to happen. But it didn't occur to me that that would be one of the outcomes. And the other thing that really excites me is the idea that a child who is incredibly shy um, or feeling too intimidated to speak out in a lesson would quite readily contribute to an online discussion if uh, in the form of a blog or um, a forum or MySpace or whatever. And, uh, and I find that very inspiring. I mean, again, the things that inspire me, I think, are fairly low level in terms of technology, either that or, or I've got used to them. But, um, and I suppose the other thing I would say is that I'm quite amazed sometimes when I think about it, I'm, I'm actually quite amazed at just how many things I end up doing at once. Um, so for example, I can be typing an article, <clears throat> uh, chatting to someone in my space and talking to two or three people using the text tool of Skype all pretty much at the same time. And uh, I find it amazing that I've got the ability to do that without making a complete deal of myself. And so, yeah, I just find this whole area so fascinating. Do, do you wish to add anything, Elaine? I, all I was going to say is that what fascinates me is how the younger generation have got used to the um, any time, any place form of communication and they adapt they use mobile phones for their calendars as much as they use them for texting and and uh, communication, you know, phone calls, as well as using MySpace. And virtually every young person I've come across has got a MySpace area. And um, they're quite happy to use the web as their first port of call for information. Whereas when we were young, it was a book and you possibly depending on your accessibility to books, you had to go to a library and you had to check that it was up to date. But these kids, they just think it's there. It's there for them. 
and they don't have to think twice about it. And I think that is a phenomenal uh, culture change. That excites me very much. Oh, and Google Docs, I forgot to mention that. The idea of collaborating on a document. If I'd have had that that tool when I was um, uh, in, in when I was working in a senior position in the local authority, it would have been fantastic. Because what one of one of the jobs I had was to get people to contribute to um, a strategic plan, and you either ended up with fifteen different versions of it, or you ended up with one version with um, lots of different comments. Um, you know, using the tracking tool in Word. But there'd always be at least one person who couldn't make heads or tails out of it and would make up yet another version. Um, something like Google Docs would have been absolutely fantastic. So, uh, you know, it's, thing, it's things like that. Anything which aids collaboration, I suppose, is, is what really turns me on. It seems to me that when I was in school, when I, when I wrote something, it was a big deal. Mm -hmm. And it was graded by a teacher, and that had a significant impact on my view of my abilities. And I probably have a box in our attic that contains all of the papers I wrote through college. And what intrigues me is that these technologies of the Read Write Web allow students to be collaborating and creating much more material than I ever did. Mm. Mm. And I'm thinking out loud that that gives them a comfort level both with what they're creating and how it's received and also their ability to create. Do you think that makes sense? Uh, yes, I do, because I've I was thinking while you were talking, Steve, that I think what this stuff does is it, it, it in effect says it's okay to make mistakes and it's okay to think aloud. And it actually took me a long time uh, to work this one out because, uh, in, in, in fact, it was only last year that I finally worked it out for myself, which is um, I've spent many years writing articles for publication. Uh, and they obviously have to be perfect, and I and I carried, or or, or as perfect as you can make them, and I carried that over to um, the stuff I put on my website, which I do try and make perfect. I mean, I spell check it and I check all my facts and so on and so forth. But I suddenly realised last week, uh, last year, that it's actually okay to have um, half-formed thoughts, because this is um, uh, this is a blog. And I can say, look, I've got this vague idea about X. What do people think? And then I get what people think by their comments. And then I can, and that helps me to actually form more of a fully formed thought. And I think that's probably what happens with kids. It's no longer the case that if you submit a piece of work, it's going to come back with red ink all over it. Uh, the implication of which is, you know, you, you've got to try harder, you know, must try harder. Um, it's actually okay for kids to say, let's let's see where see where we can go with this. And to, I, what I used to do, this was before blogs and wikis and stuff. I used to say to the kids, look, I'll I'll mark your work and I'll talk to you about it. But what we'll do um, at the end of this process is that you'll produce a perfect piece of work, and that's what we'll put in your folder for everyone to see because we know what's gone behind it. Uh, but other people don't need to know that. And and that really gave them a lot of confidence. It was like they weren't being judged in that negative way. I think Elaine wanted to say something. Did you? Well, I was just thinking that, um, I don't know, were you sort of saying, Steve, that in this day and age, you're, a, a student doesn't have to achieve what is in the teacher's mind? They can achieve more creatively because it's a collaborative collaborative process and they can talk to other people and say and, and glean their ideas and that it's an easier process to do that I'm not sure what what I meant but I think part of it is that the audience is broader mm -hmm. so the feedback can potentially be more varied and, and put into perspective and while I, 
I probably placed a tremendous amount of prominence on the opinion of one person. That was the person grading the paper. Mm. And that's not necessarily bad, but it didn't give me the same options to explore my writing and get feedback from others who might have been encouraging in different areas. Mm. Or uh, I interviewed uh, John Seeley Brown last week, and um, there had been an article um, that had floated around here in early December about the impact of Web 2.0 on schooling, and he had been quoted, so I called him. And he called this tinkering, that mm. when he grew up, he could tinker with cars mm. and motorcycles. And then there was a period of time when everything that came out, actually you weren't allowed to tinker with it. The, the cars, uh, because of the um, emission controls, you, you, know, you, you weren't actually allowed to get in and tinker around. Mm. And what he likes about the web, the new tools of the web, is that you can tinker, you can create, you can take a movie and put it up on YouTube. Mm. And, and it seemed to me that that doesn't negate the powerful impact of a, of a single teacher who can really help you, but it sort of expands the opportunities to be creative and to feel that your creativity um, can come in a lot of different forms in different ways and, and appeal to different people. Mm. I think in some ways it actually makes the role of the teacher more important. I remember when I left, um, we had primary schools. I left at the age of 10 to go to our secondary school. And my teacher said to us, uh, the most in question, important question is to ask why. And it actually, I think, puts an onus on the teacher to teach young people to think, why? Why is this person saying this? What, have they, what is their motivation? They need to be more questioning in order to be able to evaluate the information. Because in the past, you had textbooks which said A is the fact. And you were pretty sure that A was the fact. But you have this wonderful thing called the web where A may or may not be the fact. And the, child, the young person has to know how to evaluate this and what weight to give it. And I think the onus now is on teachers to to help young people to think for themselves and become questioning adults. That might be a subversive thought, actually. I don't know. <laughs> well, no, in many ways, I think there are a lot of people who would agree with you. First, probably because we know these kids are, are encountering resources outside of school which need to be looked at skeptically and with some insight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm but also because the scope has been expanded and um, uh, there's so much new knowledge and new material that I hear teachers saying, I can't be the expert. Mm -hmm. I have to show someone how to become their own expert mm -hmm. in this material. Do you, do you know, Steve, one of the, the most satisfying lessons I ever had was, um, and this was back in... Uh, when was it? Must have been. Sorry? I was just wondering what that was. It was means. back in 1993, I think it was. Um, I, I walked into a group of students, uh, a class of students, aged uh, 15, and I said, Look, what I want you to do is um, use any software you like to set up a system whereby um, a shopkeeper could take orders over the phone, and if someone said something like, I'd like two shirts, three pairs of socks, and so on and so forth. You could instantly work out a discount and um, uh, or delivery charge, and, and, and that's what I want you to do. And I said, you've got six weeks to do it in, you see. So they all went off in their various ways. And one pair of students, because I had them working in pairs, said, um, how do you do this? And that worked out on paper, this really elaborate system, which would involve programming in Visual Basic or something. And it looked really good. And they said to me, how would you do this? And I said, I really don't have a clue. I said, why don't we sit down and work it out? So while they were looking in the help of Excel, I, w I was um, delving into these books on, on Visual Basic for applications, which I brought in. Um, and the great thing was, is that none of the students in the class said, hang on a minute, you're the teacher, you're meant to know this stuff. 
and that I think is a big difference. It, it, you know, if, if I'd have been a geography teacher and someone had said, "What's a volcano?" and I'd said, "I haven't a clue," they may have been slightly suspicious of my qualifications. Um, but saying, "I'm sorry, I don't know," in this context is not only perfectly okay, but I think actually takes away the fear factor and frees the kids up in in the sense of saying. If a teacher doesn't know, then it's okay for me not to know, and we can discover together. And, and and it wasn't put on, I genuinely didn't know, but we just kind of worked out together what we needed to do in order to make this happen. And we actually got it working, but in, in a sense, that was an added bonus. So one of the bloggers, I think it was um, Jeff Utech from Shanghai, yes. used the analogy of the teacher as a tour guide. Mm. And then um, someone on one of the educational lists said that for many years they've used the phrase, um, not the sage on the stage. Oh, but the, guide the guide on the side. The side. Mm. Right. Yes. Absolutely. So I don't want to uh, finish without giving you a chance to talk about the new version of the book. Oh, thank you. Wow. So can, let's shift gears a little. <laughs> <laughs> and give you a chance to toot, toot the horn of, of the many contributors in your own as you are prepared to release this new version. Yes. Uh, well, this has kind of grown exponentially. I mean, I've got the table of contents here, and there's something like, um, let's have a look. look there's, there's 14 sections in it all together, and I think there's well over 100 chapters. There's something like... Um, if, if if everyone contributes, there, there'll be something like uh, there'll be 58 contributors, including a few students, because I thought it would be really good to get their point of view. Um, and there, there's all of all of the kinds of people you will have heard of, most of them anyway, on the internet. And what I'm really really pleased with is the fact that um, uh, around about half of them are women. Um, which I, I, I felt women were underrepresented in the first version, uh, but they're very well represented here. And there, there's some, I've learned so much just from reading these contributions. You know, I, I've looked at some of the chapters and thought, oh, well, I didn't know you could do that. Excuse me. Um, the, 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 chapter in, the, the book includes one chapter, for example, of a discussion that went on between two people in Second Life which I think is absolutely fascinating, um, you know, just because of the way it was done. Uh, the, the, there are chapters about how to use Skype in, in a learning context. There's fantastic stuff. And, and, and there's academic-ish kind of stuff as well about how to undertake assessment using Web 2.0 tools and how to use electronic portfolios. So this whole resource is incredibly rich. I think it is going to be so um, useful to people. I don't mean that in an arrogant, big-headed way. I hope you understand that. Um, I mean it in the sense that this would be a really good first port of call for people, I think. Someone who thinks, I've heard of wikis, I'd like to explore how to use them, what are they, what are they all about? And they could actually use this as a starting point. Because, And I say starting point because we, we, we are referencing lots of other things as well, like the K-12 online conference and uh, the Flat World Project, all of those kind of things will be referenced. But this, would, I think, would be a really good starting point for someone who really doesn't know where to start. So, um, and what I'm going to do, because it's so big, uh, I mean, it's ridiculously large in a sense, um, I'm, going, I'm hoping to bring out each section as a self-contained um, electronic book as I complete them. So uh, at the end, there'll still be the whole book that you could get, but you'll also be able to get or download the individual sections as well as an e-book, which hopefully will would go, will get over the fact that there are hundreds of pages to print out. <clears throat> but I think it will be really, really good when it comes out. My, and my only worry is that um, some of it was out of date a week after it, it was it was submitted if you see what I mean so there's constant updating going on you know I, I, I keep getting contributors saying do I have time to update my chapter and I always say yes but one of these days I'm gonna to have to say no I'm sorry um, 
but you can update it online or something. But yeah, it will will be really really good, I think. I downloaded the first version. I what did you think out. of it? Well, I read every page of it, mm. and uh, I circled all kinds of things and took notes. In this day of electronic media, I find I'm still very much a print person. Yes, mm. absolutely. I, I need to be able to write in the margins, and I need to be able to mm. circle. But I, I read every page, and, and I will probably read every page of the new version, uh, and I'm very excited about it coming out. Mm. Shall I tell you what I think is really, really a great thing about it? Um, apart from the fact that the contributors are great people and, and real experts, and they're all given incredibly generously of their time, um, what is really good is that there's a lot of overlap. Um, and the reason I, I wanted that was because I just think, well, if I write about wikis, you, you might not really kind of understand what I'm saying. Someone else might write about wikis, and then you would read that and think, oh, now I get what Terry was talking about, because they've expressed it in a way that somehow gels with you, whereas I didn't hit the spot. Um, and that's what I wanted. I wanted a certain amount of overlap and redundancy so that people... What I also wanted was um, people to think, oh, that person works in a school just like mine. I mean, one of, one of the uh, big bugbears I have is that if you phone up a software company and you say, could I have, um, do you have any reference sites that I could visit where I can see your software in action? They invariably refer you to a school which has spent $10 million on this particular software and where every teacher in the school has gone on a three-day training course to use the software. And I'm not interested in that. I want to see the software in use in a school where when I turn up, the network has just broken down. Um, where some of the kids are running riot and where the teacher has had to decide between buying the software and buying a new laser printer because that to me is the reality that most teachers work in. And I think hopefully this book will be a, a similar thing that someone will think, oh, I, I teach in a class just like that or that sounds like my school district, not some wonderful utopian visionary place that not many people actually that is not the the everyday reality for most people. So uh, I, th I think people will enjoy it. Hopefully, I'm sure they will. When when do you anticipate the first uh, portion coming out? <laughs> Sorry, my Skype connection seems to have gone down on us. <laughs> uh, what's that? There's a lot of static on this. Like it's the transatlantic. Um, well. <laughs> Um, I keep putting it back. I, I'm really hoping to have it completed by the end of February. I, I've uh, booked out the time in my diary. You see, one of the problems is, is that because um, we work for ourselves, when, when business comes along, when opportunities come along, we actually can't say, sorry, I'm finishing a book, which um, we're giving away for nothing. We, we actually have to say, yes, certainly we'll do the work. So I'm doing stuff like getting up at five o'clock every morning and working for a few hours on it. Certainly, well I won't say certainly, I don't, don't wish to tempt Providence, but I, I'm, I'm definitely working towards uh, an end of February launch date for the whole thing, hopefully. Fingers crossed. Am I right in noticing that you have been releasing a few chapters here and there? That's right. That, that, yes, in fact, um, thanks Steve, I meant to say that and I forgot. Um, in order to... Um, because I feel guilty about not having released the whole thing um, and people have contributed stuff and not seen it, I've started to release individual chapters um, on a piecemeal basis. So I think this, the, the book will still be valuable because the alternative, of course, is just to print off lots of individual chapters from, from my blog uh, or from the contributors' blogs because I've, I've said to them, print, you know, publish it if you like. Um, but yes, I have been doing that, and it's partly, I suppose, to whet people's appetite as well. Um, and I'm going to try and do that, do do another chapter at least once or twice a week. You know, I, I'm going through the process of editing it and checking with people that they're happy with the edits and, and that sort of thing. But if I can get one or two hours a week, it, it won't seem quite so long um, for people to have to wait. Are you using Google Docs to collaborate on the chapters? Uh, well, interestingly enough, um, 
No, and, 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 and the, reason, the reason is, I mean, I should be, and I, I feel really bad that I'm not. Um, I, start, I, I just found it easier to cope with uh, or, or, or to handle if I, if I did it in a more old-fashioned way. So I've been sending contributors their document uh, or, or telling them where they can download it. And, and basically saying, if you need to make an amendment, could you just make the amendment and change the name slightly? I've actually found that easier to cope with than using Google Docs. But I think that's probably something to do with um, a sort of catch-22 situation that, that that one finds oneself in, which is that probably using Google Docs to collaborate on such a large number of documents would actually work quite well. But I don't really feel I have the time or the confidence to to experiment with that on this kind of scale when I've got a real project to do. It, does that make sense? Maybe for version three. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yes. Terry and Elaine, I, I want to thank you for taking the time. I've really enjoyed visiting with you. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. We've enjoyed it too. The post-show commentary with Terry Lane was so interesting that I have retained it and included here. Did we not touch on anything that you wish that we had talked about? No, I think that was fine. I'm sorry I, I feel I rambled a bit in places, but... Um, you know, but to me, that's the whole it. point. Oh, okay. You know, I, uh, I've had several people uh, specifically say to me, Oh, we love your interviewing style. And I've just had to laugh because I, you know, I don't consider myself an interviewer. But I, I think what I've done that people like is that I give them lots of time to talk about things they care about. Mm. You know, it's like being the great conversationalist. You know? <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A yes. great conversationalist is someone who doesn't talk. Yes. Yes. Right. Yes. But I, but I, I tell you, I, I really enjoy these conversations, and I, you know, I've written down three or four notes of things that kind of occurred to me as we went along, where I feel like they were insights that I want to kind of capture and remember, mm. and you know, kind great. of look Thank out you. for. Well, the great so thing I, is, as well, it certainly made me think about um, a few things as I've been talking, and, and, and I'm sure the same with Elaine as well. Mm. It, it's a great process. You know, it, uh, this... I I really like podcasts. I'm sorry, Elaine, I talked over you. I was just going to ask you, Steve, do you do this as a, like for a living, or uh, is this just a hobby for you? I do this I do this to the shock and chagrin of my business partner and my wife. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what in the world I'm doing. So my company sells uh, computers to schools. Oh, right. Nice. And this is part of a great experiment. <clears throat> One of the things that I really like about blogging and these technologies is that I think they produce transparency. I think mm -hmm. they, they have an opportunity to, to enhance and create transparency. And part of, part of what I keep telling my business partner and my wife is that I want to be engaged in helping schools. And, and we've sold computers to schools for a long time, and mm -hmm. and I I want to I want to kind of follow the model of Google, which is let's find things to do that we think will really make a difference, and see if we can't then help create loyal customers because of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, yes. and it is a it is a bit of an experiment. What, part of what's interesting is that I am now getting asked to speak quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel a little bit like the, the newscaster who then is asked his opinion on the news because I want to say, you know, I'm not really the expert. Mm. You know, but what I can provide you with is I can, I can give you a sense of what the people I'm talking to are saying, mm. but I'm not in the classroom and I'm not, you know, fighting the battle every day. Mm. But it is, uh, it's something I enjoy doing and, and so I'm kind of feeling like um, I'll continue to do that because it's something in my comfort zone. Mm. I, I, no, I think it's um, it, it, it's really good. Um, one of the things I meant to say, and I and I forgot, but I don't know if you you have the same experience. When when I um, 
see a comment about something I've written uh, on, on a blog or come across a blog which mentions something I've written, I'm always, um, I think, wow, someone actually noticed <laughs> and, and actually thought it might be worth writing about. I think that, and then sometimes I think, oh gosh, look, look at where that person lives. How did they come across this? Um, and I just find the whole thing incredibly fascinating and um, uh, humbling in a way, because I always think, well, why would they take any notice of me? And the reason I mention that now is because I'm just a little bit worried that when I was going on about how great the second edition of this book is, people might think what an egotist I am, but I hope it didn't come across like that. It didn't come across that way at all. Oh, in, good. In fact, uh, you know, I'm intrigued by two things that you've just mentioned. One is, as much as this is a tool for students to experience the same feelings that you and I experience when someone recognizes us, I, you know, and, and that's certainly at the heart of the childhood experience, is, is looking for recognition and, and, you know, wanting people to notice you. I think it, you know, I think it's at the heart of MySpace. You know, it's like, mm. it's like bringing a friend over to your room and showing them your doll set or your toy trains. <laughs> you know, yes. You know, come, come pay attention to me. Yes. But it's also, I think, a huge professional development tool for mm. teachers and administrators. And that's one aspect of it that I think, you know, Will Richardson kind of turned me on to this because, you know, I, I said, you know, I'm meeting with school administrators and they don't know anything about this. And he said, I no longer teach blogging for the classroom. I teach teachers how to blog for themselves. Mm. Because then they will, they have to experience the transformation that takes place in blogging before they're going to be interested in bringing it into the classroom. Mm. Yes, absolutely. Yes. What's interesting to me about a lot of this collaborative work is that in a lot of ways it involves kind of giving up this feeling of kind of holding things into yourself in order mm. to have it be your idea. And mm. and I've noticed that it's it's much more powerful to kind of let go and say, you know, I'm not going to be the expert, but I want to be a part of the dialogue. Mm, yes. And, and then you let the idea out there, and somebody builds on it, and somebody okay. corrects you, or something else happens, and then all of a sudden you discover that, wow, this feeling of participating is is just as enervating, not enervating, just as energizing, and just as thrilling for me as it was to feel like I was an expert in something. Mm, absolutely. Yes. I mean, I sometimes put things out um, or, or create things as an Aunt Sally. Do you have that phrase in um, in America? No, say that again. Uh, Aunt Sally. I'm not quite sure the the uh, etymology of it, but what it means is, is I mean, for example, in this test that I was working on, I told you about. I I, I developed what I called uh, a rules base, which was a set of algorithms by which the test would judge what level the student was on. Now, I, that was the first time anything like that had been attempted, as far as I knew. And I put it out as what, I, what we call here an Aunt Sally. The idea is, is you put it out for people to knock down. But not just to say, that's useless, but to say, that doesn't work because. But if we did this, this, and this, then it would work. And, and it's exactly the kind of thing you've just been talking about, Steve, you know, where, where you put something out, you say, I don't care about my name being on this or ownership as such I don't, I don't feel precious about anyone changing it I put this out so that people it's something to start with you know if it's no good then come up with something different or if it has a germ of something useful then, then let's work with it but it's better than people doing nothing it's got a germ of um, altruism about it in effect isn't it because you're you're sharing your ideas without the expectation that somebody's going to credit you well, and, and I think a lot of this comes from or is a part of the movement of the open source software mm -hmm. that, um, you know, this Richard Stallman was from an academic environment and sort of a belief that, you know, it was important to have things be freely available. And a lot of the Web 2.0 technologies have been built on top of open source software. And, and the people who did that came from this background of openness. And I mm. think it's, it's largely informed 
the sort of growing culture of openness, which I think is fascinating. I, I mean, I think it is absolutely historical. And it certainly had a huge impact on someone here like our President Bush, whose leadership style is old school. Hmm. And, and the culture has so moved toward openness that they're finding themselves trying to cope with difficulties in an old school way in, a, in an environment that now says, you know, we need much more than that. Yes. Um, and, and that's just, you know, one dramatic sort of, I guess, example of the cultural change that we're, that we're going through, I think. Mm. I agree. I was just think, thinking while you were talking, I was wondering if um, this cultural change on the web and this uh, sharing and open source in terms of open source software and Web 2 ideas has arisen because we've actually broken down our traditional societies where you know people lived in villages and they were all related to each other and had support networks, whereas now you've actually got that through the Web 2 idea, haven't you, and email and so on and so forth, and you've got your... your don't do that, Claudius. Claudius was kissing the microphone. Sorry oh, I about wondered that. what that was. <laughs> Claudius is the cat, I take it. Yes, yes. Yeah, sorry. But uh, what was I saying? I was rambling again. Oh, no, no, no. We, we were talking about the, yeah, the change in, in just our own social you know, networks. Yes, and, and you get support from societies that way rather than from your neighbor or your auntie down the road or your mum next door. I, I know even... That... Yeah, sorry, Don Steve. No, no, you go ahead. I, I was going to say, it's not even confined to Web 2. I remember years and years ago <coughs> uh, when um, Usenet uh, was, was really big, I would sometimes run into a problem if I was trying to devise a spreadsheet for someone and I, and I couldn't work out what the programming should be, and I'd I'd um, send up uh, send out a message saying, "Does anyone know how you make a cell do this, this, and this?" And I'd sometimes literally come down, make a cup of coffee, come back, and someone would have come up with an answer, uh, and and they get nothing from it, but, uh, except the pleasure that of actually giving someone an answer. And it's the pleasure of giving that people get, and that's that's a lovely thing, isn't it? I, I I absolutely agree, and I think that uh, it it it's nice to see that in a tangible form, mm. because yes. I think people are recognizing that. I mean, when I talk to people about open source software, when I talked to people two years ago about open source software, people had a very hard time understanding the motivation. Mm. But now, but now that people are so involved in in creating things. Uh, in other ways on the web, I think they understand a little bit better why someone would stay up till two in the morning working on something for no pay. <laughs> it's quite mad if you think about it, isn't it? That sounds like Terry, that does. <laughs> I'm sorry that I have to go, but I'm traveling tomorrow, so I have to run. Oh, oh nice. lovely. <laughs> oh, have a nice time. It's yeah, no, it's been great to talking to you. Uh, I've really enjoyed talking to you, and I hope that uh, we'll be able to keep up the correspondence. It can, sometimes, it can sometimes take me as long as a week to get these edited and posted, but oh, I'll send, I'll send you a quick note when I have it up. Brilliant. Fantastic. All right, then, uh, Steve, talk to you soon. Okay, have a good night. And, and you. you. Both. Have a good journey. Thank you. Bye. Night, Bye. Night. Bye.